ready, living in anticipation for 2021? Come on. Come on. Don't, 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 don't believe that it's already going to be like last year. Come on. Don't sit back with the bad attitude and say nothing changed. What would you expect? COVID was going to go away at the drop of the ball? I mean, come on, right? We got we to believe for better things, and that starts within us, in each and every one of us. Our outlook on life, our attitudes. Come on. When we wake up in the morning and we tell ourselves, this is the day the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. At the beginning of every year, I, I, I try to get a word from God, a single word. Uh, I would encourage you to, to pray and talk to God and see what, what's a single, singular word that would speak to you this year, your word for the year. And my, my word is the word return. Return, R-E-T-U-R-N, return. Um, And and basically what God is saying to me is this, return to the sun in 21. Return to the sun in 21. And not that any one of us have strayed very far, but I think that we need to return our focus, our mindset, our intention back to the things of God. It was very easy in 2020 to let our attention and our focus be on a lot of other things than on God and the work of Jesus Christ, all right? Now, for some, that word return means to return to church. For some, the word return means to return to some healthy habits. Anybody start a new diet? Anybody do two days of exercise, three days of exercise? I'm all alone today. I... I, All right, all right. Return to some commitments, return, whatever, whatever you need to return to. For, for me as a church as well, I'm, I'm trying to look back and say, okay, how did we do church when we were a church of 500? Maybe we need to return to the ways we did that and getting together in smaller groups and doing smaller things and thinking about church differently, all right? One of the things that I need to return to is my commitment to loving others the way that Christ loves me. My commitment to it. Because it's really easy, it's really easy lately to see somebody put up a stupid Facebook post. Come on. And I can't even say it any other way. I can't even say, well, you know, it was a well-intentioned. No, just stupid stuff. Like people just putting dumb stuff out there. And then all of a sudden, you're emotionally angry about something that somebody posted and it takes every ounce of willpower to not make a nasty comment. Many of us fall prey and do anyway. But for me, it's a challenge for me sometimes to love people. Seriously. And that's a commandment. Like, I'm supposed to do that. Like, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor. It's the two biggest commandments that we're supposed to live by. And, and, and furthermore, it's easy to bottle up hurts and pains inflicted by other people, to hide them inside, and to use those as stones to build walls around your heart so that no one else can get in there and hurt you. I'm not speaking from a textbook, I'm speaking from experience, okay? There's, there's two types of people in the world when they get hurt. There's the shutter downer and there's the exploder, all right? There's the person who yells and screams and there's the person who shuts down and internalizes it all. The one who shuts down and internalizes it all eventually one day will have an explosion. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not in five years from now, but one day all those things that you bottled up inside will come out. Right? And one of those things that we hide ourselves from is this word love, this idea of love. Love is the most important word in the English language, and it's the most confusing. Love. The singular word. It's the strongest four-letter four letter word you could possibly ever use. Bands have sung about it. There was a band called The Foreigner. Anybody remember them? That's way older than me way, way older than me. I want to know what love is. 
right? The Righteous Brothers. You've got that love and feeling. Diana Ross. You can't hurry love. No, you just have to wait. Tina Turner. What's love got to do, got to do with it? Right? We've sung about this idea of love. We, we poetically speak about love. And psychologists have concluded that the need to feel loved is a primary human emotional need. The need to feel loved is a primary human emotional need. We get so absorbed in love romance movies, right? And we watch these young couples that will do anything for love. My wife, every now and then, she reads one of those romance novel things. I've never read one in my entire life. I read a lot of books, but I've never read a romance novel. And my wife will sit down and read like a 400-page romance novel in like two days. And I look it over and she's crying and I'm like, what are you crying about? She's like so absorbed in this person's story and in their life and what's happening. And oh, Johnny just passed away. Who's Johnny? <laughs> Love is confusing especially in the English language, because the Greek language has eight words for love, and in English we have one. Eight words that the Greeks have, and I do not have time to go into all of them today. But like, let's talk about the English word love. I love the Lord my God. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my church. I love pizza. I love cars, and I love myself. But I don't love any one of those things exactly the same. Yet, I have one word to describe them all, love. All different, yet one English word, and thus it can be so confusing. It's funny, I have, a, I have two French bulldogs, and, and one's a boy, his name's Wink. And if I start loving on that dog, my son will run over and remind me who his real son, who his real, who his real son is. <laughs> he will remind me. My son will get jealous of me loving on my dog because I call him my son dog. Oh, come here, son dog. Right, that's my son dog. And then my son wants to come over and remind me I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm tell, I, I said to the dog I love him, but I don't love the dog the way I love you. At seven years old, the word love is confusing. So I cannot, in one sermon series, unconfuse the confusion of love. I'm pretty sure unconfuse is not a word, but I just made it a word. I cannot unconfuse the word love today. I cannot. But what I can do is start a conversation in your home and in your relationships about love and how you best feel loved. How do you feel loved? Because that's a problem. That, that's the biggest problem. The way I want to express love may not be the way my wife wants to receive an expression of love. Maybe she doesn't feel loved by the way I'm trying to express love. Huh? All right, can I just throw something out there? I don't see any really young kids in here today, so I can be, I'm not going to be graphic or nothing, but I can just be a little bit more real, right? So gentlemen, let's just talk about this for a second, right? And it's taken me a little over 20 years of marriage to understand this fact that when I walk into the kitchen and my wife is cooking and she got some music going and she's swinging her butt like this and I take my hand and I go, bow! I'm expressing love! Huh? 
Come on, somebody. Gentlemen, you know me right. You know it right now. Bam! Why do you got to do that for? I'm in the middle of cooking. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like showing you love. That's not love. You know you did it too. You know you still do it. You know you've been doing it for 40 years. Still getting the same response. Just showing you some love. That's not how I want to be loved. How do you feel loved? How do you express love? And listen, God desires that we know what love is. I want to know what love is. God wants to show us that. In 1 John 4, verse 9, it should come up on the screen behind me. This is how God showed his love among us. God wants to show us love. And he showed it to us by sending his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Yo, he sent us gifts before we loved him. Look at this. Not that he loved us. I'm sorry, not that we loved him, but he loved us. He loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. What a great passage. You should write that one down. Put it in your notes somewhere. 1 John 4, 9 through 11. This is how God showed. And I love, I love this fact about God, and we're going to build this into our series, is that he didn't just say, I love you. He showed his love. Sometimes, and listen, I know this sounds totally upside down. Sometimes, I think we verbally say, I love you, but our actions don't demonstrate it. I would challenge you, maybe say I love you less and act in love more often. Act in love more often. All right, we're going to build into that. God showed his love towards us. He expressed his love toward us by sending his son. This series that we're jumping into today is called The Language of Love. The Language of Love. And each of us has a love bucket or a love tank that is just waiting to be filled with the love of others. We all have a love tank that is crying out to be filled with the love of others. The human soul was crying out for God to demonstrate love, and so he did. He sent his son, and he filled our spiritual love tanks with the ability to be in a relationship with him. But the human condition is as such that our love tanks or our love buckets, they have holes in the bottom. Our love buckets have holes in the bottom of them. So it was not enough to demonstrate your love 20 years ago when you got married and then never again. I said I loved her once. Isn't that enough? It's really not because every one of our love tanks, our love buckets have holes in them and they constantly need refilling. That is why isolation is so devastating. That's why the cruelest punishment is solitary confinement. That's what was so devastating about the last 10 months that we were supposed to be shut in and shut down and not getting together with family and friends. That's what was so devastating about it emotionally is that that's how we were getting our love tanks filled, especially those whose love tank is quality time. Quality time, and let's just say it, quality time cannot be filled over FaceTime and Zoom. It is not the same thing for the person whose love language is that. This week and next week, we're going to uncover the five love languages, the five love buckets, love tanks. On January 17th, Two weeks from now, 
my friend and your friend, Ronnie Doss, will be with us. He'll be uh, doing the Sunday morning message. You do not want to miss that. He's always, always got a good word for us. And then on the 24th and 31st, we will finish up and close out the other two or other three love languages. We'll see how we go, all right? But let's look for a moment how important love is according to the Bible, all right? Let's take a look at this. In Romans 8, 37, he says, in all these things, in all these things, no matter what you've been through, no matter what 2020 looked like, come on, somebody, in all these things, it doesn't matter what your past looked like, doesn't matter what happened to you as a kid, it doesn't matter what happened to you on your way to church today. It doesn't matter that your car broke down last week, that you're losing your home, you're in debt up to your eyeballs. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We're more than a conqueror through him who loved us. We're conquerors because he conquered, okay? Okay. For I am convinced, I love that part, I'm convinced, you got to get to this place in your spiritual walk with God that you're convinced that this thing is real. Until you're convinced that God loves you, until you're convinced that he gave his son for you, until you're convinced that there's nothing that the enemy can do to you, until you're convinced, you're going to live an unbalanced life. You're going to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. You're going to be tossed to and fro with every new news article that comes out. Watch what he says. I am convinced neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else on, in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You need to affirm yourself of that today. If you're hearing anybody preach a doctrine that says that there is anything that can separate you from the love of God, they are preaching an anti-Christ message. Woo, I said it. I said it. You can post it. Because he's saying right here. He's telling you right here, there is nothing in all of creation that can separate you from the love of God. That includes yourself, your own self. Come on, somebody. Based on this passage, if we truly understand God's love towards us, then we will have strength and boldness to handle anything that comes our way. But being devoid of this knowledge creates our love tank to be empty and to be completely overpowered by the circumstances of life. If you do not believe that God is for you and not against you, if you do not believe that God loves you just the way you are, your spiritual love tank will run empty and you will not have confidence and boldness to do what God has called you to do. Let me ask you this. Maybe lately you've noticed your fuse is a little shorter. Let's just talk about relationships. Relationships. Maybe in your house, maybe in your relationship, maybe you've been fighting a little bit more. Maybe you've been yelling at your kids a little bit more. Maybe, maybe work is more overwhelming than it's ever been. Maybe the drive to work is more overwhelming and, and there's more road rage and anger. Come on, somebody. I'm just saying some stuff here today. Just throwing some stuff out. Maybe you're, more, <laughs> maybe you're taking it out on the dog. Huh? You're just feeling that there's just like this edge lately in you. And I'm not going to stand up here and say it's because someone's in sin or they're far from God. I'm just going to say it might be that your love tank is running on empty. Some of the newer cars cannot run on junk gas. Some of the newer cars, you have to put premium gas, high test gas. And if you don't, the engine starts pinging. You start getting these, like, it sounds like rice 
coming through the pipes. It's cheap gas. And listen, you can't run on cheap love. You can't run on dirty love. You can't run... You can't run when your gas tank, your love tank is low. All those impurities and those things begin to get in your system. And you get edgy, get angry. Come on, when the love tank is empty. Firstly, when our love tank is empty, we have to remind ourselves the first thing is that our source of love is God. Our source of love is God. The Bible says that God is Love. He doesn't just have love. He doesn't possess love. He's not just the creator of love. God is love. There is no love in the world without God. God is love. I love singing that new song. I hope you guys tuned in on the 27th. We did a a worship set at my house, and I love that new song, by Israel Houghton, it's, it's not actually even out yet. Like our church has been the first one that, that he's allowed us to like sing it and perform it. But it, it has this one line that says, I am loved by you. I'm loved by you. I am loved by you. I am accepted. Oh, I love that part. I am loved by you. I love that. Love by you. It's it's just a reminder, and when I sing it, is that I'm not trying to prove to God how much I love Him. I will always fall short. But when I remind myself that I am loved by God Almighty, the creator of the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in it, it gives me a confidence and a reassurance that I am loved by God. It fills my tank. It fills my tank. John 13, 23 is a picture of the Last Supper. Jesus is meeting with the disciples. He's telling them what's about to happen. And John 13, 23 says this, and one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Now, who wrote this? John. Who's the disciple that Jesus loved? John, he's writing this about himself. He didn't say Peter, whom Jesus loved. He said, no, no, no. Out of all the disciples, I am loved by you. It's, I'm I'm the one he loved. And, And because of that, it says that he was reclining next to him. And in the King James, it says that, that John was leaning against Jesus' chest. Leaning up against him. I'm loved by him, and because of the knowledge of that love, it brought me into close proximity. Whereas Peter, Peter always bragged about how much he loved Jesus. Peter's at the end of the table. Come on. You're bragging about how much you love God, and I'll live for you, and I'm committing my 2021 to God. It doesn't impress him. And in fact, it puts you kind of, it puts you at a distance like, I haven't earned it yet, but when I do the things that I promise you, then I can be closer. Where John says, I'm loved by you. I don't have to do something. I don't have to prove it. I don't have to impress you. And that brought him into close proximity. John understood what we need to understand today. Romans 5.5. 5. And hope does not put us to shame Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. He poured out his love. Can you hear it? He poured out his love onto us. And in just a few minutes, I'm going to just pour this whole bucket right out into... (laughs) He's our source. He's our love. The Holy Spirit's been given to us and God poured his love into us. Over the next few weeks, we are going to discover each of these five buckets, but I want you to find your primary love language. Your primary love language. And I know it can be hard because 
you could have a primary, secondary, and third, and they're all very, very close. But we want to really kind of discover your primary love language. I really want 2021 you to live a life more fulfilled, all right? So it's sometimes easier to know someone else's than it is your own. But I want you to try to discover yours and then look around at those around you. My hope is that once you know and understand the love language of others, you will fill their love bucket every day that you can and not use it as a weapon. Because I've seen people do that too. Huh? You know someone's love language is quality time, you're mad at them, now you ignore them and don't want to be around them. Come on, let's not be petty in 2021. Yes. Romans 13, 9 and 10 says, love your neighbor as yourself and love does no harm to a neighbor. Love does no harm. So don't use a love language to try to hurt the person by taking it away, all right? So we wanna look at our first love bucket today and it's gonna be this one right here. Words of affirmation. Words of affirmation. Words. Words of affirmation. Mark Twain once said, I can live for two months on a good compliment. What? Michaela McKelvey, my 15-year-old daughter, said she can live about 10 minutes on a good compliment. That is, that is one of the things about social media today, about uh, Snapchat, TikTok, uh, Instagram, is that the young people are using that as a way to get their love tanks filled. And, and, and it works good and bad, because if they don't get the amount of thumbs up or likes or compliments that they think they should, they're then devastated because it didn't fill their love tank. True facts. King Solomon in the book of Proverbs reminds us of this. In Proverbs 12, 25, anxiety in the heart of a man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. But a good word makes it glad. How good are you at giving other people good words? What? Solomon also said in Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. So you have the power in your words to bring life to someone or bring destruction. What are you going to choose to do? So here's some words of affirmation. You look great today. You did a fantastic job. You're the best. You are beautiful. You are amazing. The list goes on and on, right? You can give words of affirmation. Your hair looks beautiful today. I love that outfit. Men, be very careful if your wife asks you, do I look fat in this? I love your hair. <laughs> <laughs> Many of us are fluent in this love language of giving words of affirmation. However, some are not so good at it. Um, some who are married or in a relationship with someone whose love language is words of affirmation, they probably need a lot of words of affirmation. Some of us are poor at this language and we end up saying hurtful things, hurtful things that we don't realize we're saying. It's actually hurtful to that person to not give them words of affirmation. We've heard stories, I'm not saying that anybody in here has done this, but we've heard stories of fathers saying to sons, you're good for nothing. You're gonna be a bum. Why are you dressing like a slob? And this can become permanent scars on a son or a daughter for the rest of their life, hearing a negative, harsh word from their father. I'm gonna give you some, I'll give you some advice today. If you're a man and your primary love language is words of affirmation, you're always seeking to be affirmed, 
truthfully and honestly, a man can only truly be affirmed by another man. Okay? Now, there are things that men like to be affirmed by their wives or by females, like they look good, they're handsome, they take care of them, they feel secure, those things because that's what is in us to desire and want. But really for your wife to kind of say, I'm proud of you, doesn't hold the same weight as another man who's walked in your shoes saying, I'm proud of you. Because to a person with words of affirmation, it does matter who says the words. Do I esteem you as someone who has the right to say those words to me? Come on. You don't want like a 10-year-old kid come and say, I'm proud of you. Like, well, you, you don't know what I just took to do that. <laughs> my dad's love language is words of affirmation. So like my dad said to me one time, he's like, I'm never wearing this outfit again. I'm like, why? He goes, not a single person complimented me on my outfit today. He loved getting compliments on the way he goes. Pastor John Mark, he's words of affirmation, right? So those are verbal compliments. But maybe, maybe there's times that you cannot think of a verbal compliment. How else can I give words of affirmation? Well, then you can give an encouraging word. An encouraging word. The word encouraging means to inspire courage. To inspire courage. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. You can make it, right? All of us have areas in our lives that we feel insecure, areas that we lack courage, and that we lack, the lack of that courage often hinders us from accomplishing the positive things that we'd like to do. Come on, there's things you'd like to do, but you don't because you're insecure. And there's this latent potential within us that it's just waiting for one encouraging word to release it. Come on, do this with me. Let's go do this. Let's overcome this. Let's beat this. Joshua took over from Moses. He's called by God to lead the Israel uh, tribe, the people. But he was insecure. In Joshua 1.9, God comes back to him and says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For I am with you wherever you go. What an encouraging word. God is affirming Joshua. I am with you. All right, maybe you can't think of an encouraging word. Could you at least say a kind word? A kind word? I love you. I love you. They don't have to have done a good job. They don't have to look good. They don't have to smell good. But I can say a kind word. I love you. You're accepted here. We could be nice. We could say kind things. The statement, I love you, when said with kindness and tenderness, can be a genuine expression of love. Now, let me forewarn you about someone whose love language is words of affirmation. The tone in which you say those words matter to them. They got problems. They got problems, all right? I love you. I love you? I love you. Yeah, I love you. Four different ways meant four different things to the person whose love language is words of affirmation. You didn't mean it. Why do you mean I didn't mean it? I just said, I just said what you wanted me to hear. Like, but you didn't mean it. How do you know I didn't mean it? The tone of your voice. The tone of your voice matters to the person 
whose primary love language is words of affirmation. It, and in fact, it really wasn't even the word you said, it was how you said it. How you said it didn't fill my love tank. Mm. Proverbs 15.1 says this, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So even if I'm saying, I love you, the way I said it to a person whose words of affirmation could actually stir up anger. No, you don't. You didn't mean it. Ephesians 4.29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Could you imagine having conversations with people for their needs instead of you just dumping your garbage? Could you imagine having conversations, intentional conversations, that were uplifting to the person who was hearing it instead of just being a verbal release for you? We're really... We could go on and on about this love language because it is so vast, but we don't have time today. If you believe that your loved one, that their primary love language would be words of affirmation, I encourage you to do some study online. There's a bunch of different online tests that you can take. They're free, the five love languages tests, and find out what they are. Find out what love language that person speaks, and if you believe that their primary language is words of affirmation, then today, next week, sometime, find some words and speak it into their heart, speak it into their life, speak words of affirmation into them to build them up. I promise you, as you speak their love language, they will begin to reciprocate the love language that you need spoken back to you. As we close today, I want to affirm you with the words that God spoke to Moses in Deuteronomy 31.5. He said this, the Lord will deliver you and you must do to them all that I've commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. God will never leave you nor forsake you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. This was a covenant promise. And we live under the same promises today that God will never leave us. He will never forsake us. So he says to you today, be strong. Get this in you. God is saying to you, be strong and courageous for I am with you. If you haven't heard it lately, hear it today. Hear it from God. He loves you. God loves you irregardless of your past, irregardless of your present, irregardless of your tomorrow, God loves you. And if that doesn't mean enough to you, then from me to you, I love you. I love you. Hear it. Now, as humans, do we make mistakes in expressing that love and showing that love all the time? I'll be the first one to repent of that. I haven't always done this well. I haven't always been the best at expressing the love languages that people need. But what we all can do is what the Apostle Paul told us. This one thing we can do best, putting the past behind and pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. We can press towards being the model that Jesus lived out loud in front of us. Next week, we're going to continue our series on 
on the love languages. On the 17th, Ronnie Doss, look him up online. He'll be with us. You do not want to miss that. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today that your word is alive and powerful, that it's speaking to our hearts. I pray, God, that we can live a year full of love, full of peace, joy, a vision of excitement, that, God, 2021 will be a change in our lives for the good. Help us to put 2020 behind and press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling. I thank you, Lord, for a new year, a new season, a new us. Lead us, guide us into all truth. As we leave here today, Lord, I thank you that everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen.